Shut your eyes. Stop your ears. It is too late to run. Too late to defend yourself. Too late to plead or surrender. Too late for any action except a desperate and vain panic. Restless, malevolent presences surround you on all sides and there is nothing you can do to avert the excruciating doom that will take hold of you at the unseen hour. A home is a place of comfort and safety. A refuge from the chaos and hostility of the outside world. Or so we like to think. But all too often there is a darkness that slips past those sacred doors. An evil that crouches deep in the heart of your home. And day by day poisons and corrupts the purity of your domestic bliss. Perhaps this grain of discord can be found in every home. But in the new domicile of one Rufus Strideforth, husband and father, fourth class, it is more pernicious than most. Ah, welcome to your new home. A new nest for us to flourish and grow in. Oh my, Rufus, it is very large and ominous and so dusty. Yes, and isolated too. Far from the support of the nearest village or the security of local law enforcement. With only the flimsiest of telephone connections. The perfect place to finish my novel and combat my alcoholism. <laughs> and what does our precocious daughter think of the place? Yeah, it's all right. Plenty of space to ride my trike. Plenty of room to explore with my imaginary friend, Diamond Jim Francis. What do you say, Jim? Looks like that's the spot. <laughs> oh, what an idyllic family unit we are. <laughs> Run along now. I'll just toddle down to the basement and start up the furnace. Come on, Jem. Let's play. There you are, my dear. Very creaky house, too. Well, I suppose I'd better make it look like a home and get the dinner on. Holy, holy. Hello? Is someone there? Oak. 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 Oh, what's happening? How dare you venture into our mouldering crypt? You, you'll die here, probably. You'll die here like we did. The dark powers will consume you slowly and you'll lose the will to resist. You'll shut yourself away and waste to nothing, just like us, probably. Ooly, ooly. Yucky, yucky. Ock, ock, ock. Ghost, E. <laughs> Come on, Diamond Jim, let's play haunted ass. I'll be the girl, you be the exorcist. What you old my dear, but watch your language this time. Holy, holy. Jim, is that you? Hecky, hecky. I thought it was you, my dear. Oak, oak, oak. A real ghost! Not just one, but two real ghosts! <laughs> Boo! Little girl, aren't you afraid? Ah, an innocent child. Do you like your new home? We can teach you some new games to play here. Special games that everyone has to play in this house. One is played with this noose. And one is played with this shotgun. <laughs> these games are oh so fun. We played these games once and now there is nothing we'd rather do. Bloody hell, Jem. Precocious and peculiar though I am, this is all a bit much. Let's scarper. Ooly, ooly. 
Aquí, aquí. Ok, ok, ok. Uy, Flippin' ek. Ah, well, that's the central heating fix. <laughs> 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 there in the dark, cobwebby and earthen fluid basement. But what's the matter with you two? You're all pale and shaky. This house is haunted, Rufus. We must get away immediately. Ah, <laughs> stuff and nonsense. Haunted? Why, I've never heard a thing so absurd. No! Diamond Gem says this place is full of troubled and angry spirits thanks to the ancient burial ground it is built on. Ridiculous! Ancient burial grounds make fantastic foundations. It's probably just the sound of the old pipes. It's probably the wind whistling through the eaves, probably. There's a storm brewing. It's probably that. Why listen? See? Sounds a bit like voices, maybe. There's no such thing as ghosts. And listen to those pipes over here. This one sounds exactly like a voice speaking. It must be late, I thought, and I rushed out to the street and took my motorcycle. The clock in the corner showed 10 till 9. I would arrive with time to spare. The sun filtered through the tall buildings in the city and I rode savoring the ride. The motorcycle rumbled between my legs and a fresh breeze toyed with my clothes. I passed the buildings and the shops with brilliant windows on the high street and now I entered the most pleasant part of my trajectory, a long street lined with trees with little traffic. Perhaps my involuntary relaxation impeded me from preventing the accident. When I saw that the woman who was stopped on the corner launched out into the intersection despite the green lights, it was already too late. I heard the woman scream and together with the blow, I lost my vision as if knocked out. I came to. Four or five men were pulling me from under the motorcycle. I tasted salt and blood. My knee hurt. And when they lifted me, I shouted because I couldn't stand pressure on my right arm. Voices encouraged me with jokes and assurances. My only relief was in hearing confirmation that the right of way had been mine. I saw the woman and had nothing more than scrapes on her legs. It barely caught you, but the crash made him fly off the bike on his side and... The ambulance arrived in five minutes and they lifted me into a soft stretcher. My arm almost didn't hurt. Blood from a cut on my eyebrow dripped all over my face. I licked my lips a few times to taste it. I feel good. It was an accident, but luck, a few weeks of keeping still and, and nothing more. As they wheeled me in on a stretcher to a wing at the far end of the hospital, passing under the trees filled with birds, I closed my eyes and I wish I was asleep or put under. But they finally brought me into a room that smelled of hospital. After a while, I was moved to the operating room. Someone dressed in white approached me and examined my radiography results. I perceived that they were moving me from one stretcher to another. The man in white patted my cheek and gave me a signal to someone standing behind. It was a curious dream because it was full of smells and never smelled and I never dreamt of smells. But the smell of swamp and then in its place came a dark and complex fragrance like the night through which I was fleeing the Incas and it was so natural. I had to flee the Incas who were on a hunt for men and my only chance was to hide myself in the densest part of the jungle. The smell tortured me most. It smelled like wool, I thought, instinctively fingering the stone dagger that was stuck in my belt. A sudden noise made me duck and left me immobile, trembling. The noise didn't repeat. It had sounded like a broken branch, maybe from an animal that had escaped the smell of wool, like me. I strengthened slowly, but I was hit by a blast from that horrible smell I feared most, and I desperately leaped forward. He is going to fall from the bed, the nurse said from my side. Don't jump so much, mate. I opened my eyes and it was late. With the sun already low in the windows of the large room, my arm casted, hung from an apparatus of weights and pulleys. I was thirsty, as if I had been running for miles, but they didn't want to give me water. The fever was slowly worsening and I 
couldn't, I could have gone back to sleep, but I enjoyed the pleasure of staying awake. No more nightmares. Night fell, and a marvelous cup of golden soup arrived, smelling of leek, of celery, of parsley. A slice of bread more precious than an entire banquet crumbled bit by bit. My arm didn't hurt anymore, and only me and my eyebrow were there. And my eyebrow, where they had stitched, sizzled at times with a short, hot, shooting pain. For a moment, all my senses were dulled or mixed. I was cornered. My hand clutched with a dagger rose like a scorpion instinctively to my neck with my amulet hung. Barely moving my lips, I murmured the calm prayer that brings good moons. I begged to the gods watching over us. I heard the shouts and I straightened up with a jump, dagger in hand. I saw torture moving close by. The smell of war was unbearable, and when the first enemy jumped to my neck, I almost felt the pleasure sinking the stone blade into his chest. But the lights already surrounded me, and rope trapped me from behind. It's the fever, said one in the bed next to mine. Drink some water and you'll sleep well, you'll see. Someone had put a bottle of water in my nightstand. I drank it greedily. My face felt cool, my eyebrow hardly hurt, as if the pain were a memory. I tried to focus on the moment of the accident, and there was only a hole between the crash and the moment in which they had lifted me from the ground. The fainting or wherever I was allowed me to see nothing. It was strange. I'll ask the doctor some time. Now the dream was beginning again. The odor of humidity of damp rock caught my throat and forced me to wake up. Absolute darkness enveloped me. I wanted to straighten up and felt the robes around my wrist and hands. With my chin, I sought contact with my amulet and realized that they had taken from me. From far off, I heard the celebration drums. They had taken me to the temple. I was in the dungeon of the temple, waiting for my turn to ascend to the sacrificial steps. I saw the double door open. The priest Acolytes approached me, glaring with the states. They ease the robes. They lift me, always face up. The four Acolytes carry me to the passageway. They went on endlessly in the red half-light, tagging me brutally, and I didn't want them to, but how they had impeded me by taking the amulet that was my true heart, the center of my life. I passed with a jump back to the night of the hospital. I thought I'd scream, but those around me slept silently. It was difficult to keep my eyes open. The drowsiness was stronger than me. I made one last effort. I weakly reached toward the bottle of water. I wasn't able to grab it. My fingers closed around the space that was again black. And the passageway went on interminably, rock after rock, until we were outside the dungeon under the moon. And I, face up, desperately closed and opened my eyes, hoping to pass to the other side to discover again the protective ceiling of the hospital room. And each time I opened them, it was the moon once again. As we climbed the stairway, suddenly I saw the red rock, brilliant with dripping blood. With one last hope, I, part, I parted my eyelids. For a second, I thought I had done it, because once again, I was in bed, safe. But it smelled of death. And when I opened my eyes, I saw the bloody figure of the high priest that came towards me with a stone knife in his hand. I was able to shut my eyelids once more, but now I know that I would not wake. That I was awake. That the marvelous dream had been the other. Absurd like all dreams. A dream in which I had ridden the strange roads of astonishing city with red and green lights that burned with neither flame nor smoke, with an enormous metal insect that buzzed beneath my legs. In the infinite light of that dream, they had also lifted me from the floor. Someone had also cut me with a knife in his hand, with me lying face up, face up with my eyes shut in the midst of the fires. <laughs> You're right, that pipe does sound exactly like someone speaking. <laughs> Nevertheless, there really are malevolent ghosts threatening anyone who enters this mansion. Now I won't hear any more of this nonsense. There's no such things as ghosts, and that's final. Now we'll all sit down and eat this delicious dinner your mother's made. Why, right, but I think you are... Yeah. Ah, not another word. Sit, eat. What's for dinner, dear? Awful. Is it awful? Yes. Good, fine. <laughs> Holy, holy. Oh, Rufus, it, it's happening. 
morning again. Be quiet! We will eat dinner! We will live here! We will all be very, very happy! <laughs> the evil things are gonna get us! Stupid child, do as you're told! Look! 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 There! Oh. Once a carefree youth going on rambling adventures with my posse of young comrades, tripping along train tracks and discovering buried treasures, until one day we stumbled up across this old house, and the dark and bloody secrets hidden beneath its foundations and built into its very walls. Soon the gruesome spirits living here tempted me into their service, and one by one I'd done away with me old companions in various violent and improbable manners. Only stopping when the thoughtful, handsome but nerdy one heroically pushed me off the roof down onto my crunchy end on the paving stones below. So now I'm a ghost. A little bit about me there, in case you were wondering. <laughs> what do you want? You should not have come here, this house here, to this house. <laughs> There are evil spirits here, and you will not leave this place alive. Oh, heavens! Your charming nuclear family will not save you. You will turn against each other and yourselves! Do you think you, you can resist the great power of the dark spirits that are bound to this tainted earth? Nobody can escape ancient evil in this place. It seeps through the very bedrock and corrupts mortal flesh at first contact. It's too late, I'm afraid. Oli, Oli, Eki, Eki, Ock, 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 Oi, Run for your lives! Out of the house! Me first! Ah! A blizzard! What can we do? Let's make a run for it. We never make it! Look! The old landscape is covered in a thick layer of Paul Mosley and Maya McCourt! <laughs> that was quick. There is a lighthouse with all the lights out Quiet place but lonely Wind from the south came and blew the light out So I got lost on my way to your love Did I ramp that darkness around me Like a suit of armor Got so alone, got a heart like a stone So I got lost on my way to your love Got so alone, got a heart just like a stone So I got lost on my way to your love There were times when I would wander Through old endless diary pages If you were even out there At all in these dark, dark Candle out to 
you got lost on your way to your love Opened my mouth and I blew that candle out So you got lost on your way to your love You ready, everybody? <clears throat> All right, then. It seems that, in a surprising twist, the isolated location of our new house has backfired, leaving us beset by ghosts and beyond the reach of any help. Huh. Who could have foreseen that? Oh, here comes the criticism. I think I'm entitled. Oh, do you? You're being punished for your past sins. Watch it, you little toe rag. <laughs> yes. Turn against each other. Join the parade of damnation. <laughs> this is where you belong now. You might as well give in. It'll be easy. Give in never! Oh, Imogen, my beloved, I didn't mean to raise my voice to you. I don't know what came over me. Possibly ghosts, but also possibly my own inner demons. Oh, Rufus, let's not become bitter and resentful. We must stick together and support each other, come what may. Oh no! Uh, they're reinforcing their wholesome familial bonds! Oh, this is bad news for us ghosts! <laughs> Mum, Dad, I support you in your newfound mutual respect and harmony. Uh, but don't you think it would be much easier to solve your disputes with suspicion, aggression, and eventually homicide? You leave us alone, you horrible old spectres! You've had your time and it's over! This is our house now, and we intend to make it a happy home. Oh, not much we can say to that. Perhaps this way we will finally be able to rest. Yeah, unless this resistance provokes the deeper, darker powers that bind us all here. Something terrible is approaching. Something vile and, and ancient. Your last hours slip away with a tick, tick, tock. In the deepest depths of night, you'll hear a knock, knock, knock. Oh, no. A scary nursery rhyme! <laughs> then Grick, Grick will come to get you with a shiver and a shock. He'll keep you here forever under lock and key. No, uh, key and lock. <laughs> Down in, down in Uli, Uli, Eki, Eki. What do these words mean? Ark, Ark, Ark. Oh, yeah. Welcome back, Strideforth. Such a pleasure to have you return to us again. Return again? What do you mean? This is where you belong, Strideforth. Here with us, here in the dark, here down below. You leave my family alone? But of course, your family are your concern alone. And you are mine. Ah, no, let me go! No, put him down! <laughs> Come, stride for. Come home. Help! No! No! Not into the basement! <laughs> Rufus! We have to go in after him! The door won't open! Here's an axe. Stand back. Now, if I can reach through... Rufus? Rufus, are you down here? Hello, Imogen. <laughs> oh, it's all right. I'm all right. It, it was horrible, but it's, good. it's all going to be... It's all going to be all right now. Oh, good, because it looked like something terrible was happening, but now that I see you sitting completely composed in the middle of the scary basement, I am mightily reassured. <laughs> yes, you, you are a very, very clever girl, aren't you, Mars? Let me clarify for you. You, 
Do you see the earthen floor here? Yes, Dad, I can see the floor. Yes, yes, that is where I will bury you. After I have consumed your entrails. Stay back, Rufus. I I still have this axe. Don't make me... Ow. (laughs) I'm sorry, Rufus. Quite understandable, given the circumstances. Oh, it is rather nasty. Yes, there's a a good deal of the way through my enormous shoulder. Not to mention the damage to the tweeds. You did rather force me to. Yes, but now, due to preternatural determination and strength, I have the axe. Oh, no. Holy, holy, Aki, Aki! And so, don't worry about it. <coughs> and so, a family. There we go. <laughs> After some technical difficulties, a family all together settles into their new home, from which they will never part. The nightmare of history gains weight and momentum as horror begets horror. Habit and tradition calcify into shabby cycles of abuse and cruelty, which no single one of you, dear listeners, has the strength to break, and which could reach out its skeletal hand and take hold of any one of us at the unseen hour. We hope you were thrilled by The Unseen Hour, episode 10, The Dark Hearth. It was recorded live at the Rosemary Branch Theatre in London by Andy Goddard. It was performed chillingly by Bryce Stratford, Joey Timmons, and James Carney, and featured a monologue written by Sergio Maggiolo and performed by Miguel Hernando Torres Umba. The musical guest was Paul Mosley. Theme music by The Unrecorded. The Unseen Hour is created, written, and produced by James Carney, and the podcast is produced cryptically by Andy Goddard. (laughs) It was brought to the Rosemary Branch Theatre by Unattended Items. You can find The Unseen Hour in the many cobwebby cellars of the internet. We all look forward to seeing you here again at The Unseen Hour. Not everybody, not everybody, just the people involved in the show, the writers.